Hi, uh, I'm Peter Gardat. I'm the founding editor of Breaking Energy, and you are uh, currently watching the Edison versus Tesla uh, Google Plus Hangout hosted by the Department of Energy. And um, I am just going to give a couple of quick background remarks, and then I'm going to introduce you to our panel. So uh, Tesla and Edison, uh, one of science history's great duos. Uh, both have granted their names and their legacies to companies and really entire fields of study, employment, and businesses. Uh, but unlike some of the more distant figures of the past, uh, people are still arguing about which one w is more important and which one is more inventive. Uh, at a time when innovation is really the biggest buzzword and technology is kind of the fastest growing promise for a better future, their examples have never been more important or more current. Now, when Forbes magazine can run an article declaring that Nikola Tesla wasn't God and Thomas Edison wasn't the devil, uh, you know that the debate over each man's legacy is far from over. Both men presented over one of them, presided over one of the most sweeping changes in mankind's history, the advent of electric lighting. And they lived to see their work implemented on a global scale, turning our planet from one that used to go dark at night to one that now glitters from space and lets us live in unprecedented ways. Now, the Department of Energy has asked some of the liveliest minds around to debate the subject of Tesla versus Edison, and we've joined them today on this Google Plus Hangout to get the latest on the historical debate, as well as the lessons they offer us today. So I'll introduce each of them, and then let them say a few words about their work, and then we'll get straight into the discussion. So we're looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, first up today is uh, Dr. Rob Ivester, who is Deputy Director of the Energy Department's Advanced Manufacturing Office. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer by trade, uh, a bit of an Edison and his Tesla history buff, and he can answer questions about how we are still using their ideas today in manufacturing and scientific fields. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Stephen Frank. Uh, Steve is a commercial buildings engineer at the Department's National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And he's an expert in electric power distribution systems and can answer questions about uh, the difference between AC and DC power, the efficiency of power generation, and the war of the currents, which we got a lot of questions on. And finally, we have Dr. Bernie Carlson, who is professor of science, technology, and society at the University of Virginia. He's author of Tesla, inventor of the electrical age. And Professor Carlson can talk about the rivalry between those two inventors and how their inventions, in, innovations, excuse me, are still being used today. Uh, so, Rob, if you want to kick us off, and then we'll go um, to Steve, and finally, Bernie, just talk a little bit about your work and the Tesla versus Edison debate. Sure. Thank you very much, Peter. And good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us here on Google+. Plus. Um, you know, I've uh, long been fascinated with the rivalry, rivalry between Edison and Tesla. I think they've each made some really important and interesting contributions. And uh, one of the big distinctions that I would draw between them is the degree to which they were able to see their innovations uh, taken to life and implemented and used by society during their lifetime. And uh, Edison made many great contributions, and uh, our society benefits greatly from things that he did. Uh, much of what he developed in his time, he got to see significant implementations of. And Tesla, I think, was uh, a longer-term visionary that had uh, more fundamental and uh, far-reaching uh, benefits coming out of the technologies that he saw coming to life. And we still today are working towards adopting and deploying technologies that he had a strong and foundational contribution to. And one of the key things I take as a, a representation of that is that the scientific measurement community saw fit to uh, assign a basic unit of measurement to his name. Um, Tesla is the standard unit of intensity of magnetic fields. And I think that speaks volumes about the importance of his contributions. Great. Thanks. Uh, Steve? Matt, hi. Uh, so I, I work in the Commercial Buildings Research Group here at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And where, where we are doing research is right in the heart of uh, where Edison and Tesla's debate over AC and DC electricity, it's kind of their hallmark debate, over 100 years ago is still playing out today as we have new technologies that we're, that we're using in buildings and on the electric grid. Uh, some of which are AC, some of which are DC. And my research really plays into how do you use electricity most efficiently inside of a building? And part of that debate is should we be using AC or DC? So I look forward to 
discussing that a little more. Thanks, Bernie. Well, I'm very glad to be here. I'm a historian by training, and I've spent the last 30 years studying inventors, including both Edison and Tesla. And I'm really interested in the sort of method or style that inventors have. And and as, as folks have already pointed out, Tesla was very much the visionary and the sort of, as, as Alexander Graham Bell would say, the theoretical inventor. And that his, his style really was to think and to visualize what, what the possibilities were. In contrast, I think it's important to recognize that uh, Thomas Edison had a very different style or approach to invention, namely that he worked from the bench top. He was, a, was much more of a hands-on sort of inventor and far more interested in the actual manufacture and production of, of his inventions. But as I've, I've always emphasized, any, any, any modern society needs an interesting mix of individuals that combine both the styles of Edison and the style of Tesla. So I'm very glad to have a chance to uh, talk with lots of people about that today. Thanks. Uh, so I would like to note that the uh, questions that have already come in uh, via Twitter, Facebook, email, and elsewhere. Um, and I'll be asking those questions, both the ones that have been submitted previously and the questions we're taking live right now. Uh, you can submit those questions on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, by using the hashtag Edison versus Tesla. And many of you have already used that hashtag, and we're looking forward to answering those questions. Uh, so the first thing, the one that really came up, as I mentioned before, was the war of the currents. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of confusion about what that means and how it played out. And also, uh, we had Brandon from Twitter asking, uh, how was Tesla and Edison's relationship? Was it still strained after the war of the currents finished? So uh, Bernie, as an expert on kind of the two and their history together, could you talk about that a little bit? Sure, I'd be glad to. So the Battle of the Currents uh, is, uh, refers to a series of struggles between different electrical inventors and electrical companies uh, from the mid-1880s to the, the mid-1890s. And in particular, there was one side that argued that the future of, of electricity was going to be built around small uh, central stations using Edison's direct current and his incandescent lamp. On the other side, there were a series of companies, uh, but at the forefront was Westinghouse and Tesla, who believed that the future of electricity was to build larger citywide, if not regional, stations that took, took advantage of alternating current power and Tesla's invention of, uh, of the first practical AC motor. Now, what I found in my research is, 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 is while it's easy for us to set up Edison and Tesla as being uh, polar opposites, being very different sorts of personalities, interested in these different sorts of approaches, as the battle of currents played out and, and increasingly, at least in the American context, uh, companies, utility companies decided to install alternating current, um, the, 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 you know, the struggle really went away and it became less and less personal between the two men. So that indeed, even by 1894, you have uh, Tesla commenting in, in letters that he's just received a, uh, an autographed picture from Edison, which he thinks is, uh, is, a, is a great treasure. It's something that he thought was very special. Similarly, in 1904, 1905, when Tesla's deep in his wireless power, uh, Edison decides to come to an annual meeting of the Electrical Society, uh, the AIEE, in New York City. And Tesla, excuse me, Edison didn't normally come to those meetings because he was so hard of hearing, it was hard for him to interact with folks. So it was very unusual he came to this meeting. Uh, he slipped into the back of the auditorium, and Tesla at that point was making a presentation. And Tesla broke out of his presentation and said, Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Edison is here with us tonight. Let's have a big round of applause for Thomas Edison. So I think that that illustrates that, you know, as the alternating battle between AC and DC played out, uh, it did not continue to be this bitter rivalry between the two men, but indeed that the two men it learned how to respect each other and kind of get on with the, the, the kind of work that they wanted to do. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, so. Our next question uh, comes from Ed Miller via email. Uh, given today's knowledge of electrical generation and use, what changes um, would Edison and Tesla probably make to our current electric power use, uh, and how, how would the, that happen? Um, I think, Steve, you, you'd probably be well positioned to answer that. Sure, I certainly can. So 
during the war of the currents, what really won the war for alternating current or AC current were two technologies. One is, is the transformer, which lets you step electricity from a low voltage up to a high voltage and transmit it a long distance over power lines without losses. DC, you can't do that. So that was one technology. And the other technology was that Tesla invented the induction motor, which is a motor that runs purely on alternating current, unlike the motors at the time that used direct current. And between the transformer and the induction motor, you could get an entire industrial system, a factory set up using only alternating current. So those, those technologies at the time were really the state of the art in electricity transmission and distribution. So that's what set the, the stage for the next 50 years of alternating current winning the war between AC and DC, and then going on to become the technology that was used in our entire electricity transmission network. But things have changed a lot since the late 1800s, early 1900s. And today, we actually have many more technologies that are using direct current, or DC, than we do alternating current. So things, things have changed a lot, especially since the 1950s, when the transistor was invented, you know, anything that is now um, a computer or a small portable electronic device, um, or even such things like your, um, your compact fluorescent light bulbs or your LED light bulbs, all of these technologies, they actually use direct current. And they connect into the electric grid, um, and they use a converter that converts alternating current to direct current. So we've kind of come full circle, where it used to be that you could you could generate AC, transmit AC, and then you use AC. But now we generate AC, we transmit it, <clears throat> but we use DC. And the other thing that has happened is that we are now able to step DC up to high voltages and transmit it over long distances very efficiently using large power electronics converters that use transistors or other power electronics technology. So these things did not exist in the beginning. And if, if the transistor had existed in the late 1800s, it could have been a very different picture because Edison would have been able to compete uh, in these same areas that, the, that AC electricity was doing so much better. So I think today, really what we have is a situation where a mixture of AC and DC, depending on the application, is appropriate. And in fact, we do have high voltage DC transmission lines. They're very efficient, and they're used to transmit electricity over very long distances, for example, from Washington State all the way down to California. Uh, there is one continuous DC transmission line. So I think, I think we're coming to understand that the technology that we have today calls for a mixture and a shifting back from not only AC to both AC and DC, depending on exactly what you're doing. Great. Uh, thank you. Now, there have been a lot of questions about uh, Tesla's work in uh, wireless energy transmission and uh, perhaps a little bit of confusion about the degree to which that's even possible. Uh, so we had a question from Dr. Dr. Charlie uh, Corsija, I hope I'm saying that name correctly, via email, um, asking if there was any documentation of that work and if it's even possible as we understand the science today. Uh, so Rob, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure, thank you very much. Um, so the, the wireless transmission of electrical power is absolutely possible, and it's a technology that is increasingly propagating into the commercial sector today. Uh, most of us here on the Hangout probably have some form of wireless uh, power transmission device uh, in our home. It's used for uh, uh, recharging phones, uh, electric toothbrushes, or shavers. Uh, so if you've got like one of these little docks that you can just drop your device into, and it doesn't actually have a metal connector it just rests in there. The device is generating a local electromagnetic field and based off of harvesting energy out of that electromagnetic field it's recharging a battery. And this is similarly being propagated into uh, charging stations, wireless charging stations for uh, electric and hybrid vehicles. And I saw a very interesting news release just yesterday, a little shout out to NC State. Uh, NC State has uh, put out there an idea of embedding um, pulse recharging systems into the highway to dramatically extend the range of electric vehicles. So this idea of being able to transmit power wirelessly uh, through the use of electromagnetic fields is absolutely possible and is a, a part of reality here today. But there are significant limitations when it comes to uh, the safety and the efficiency of this transmission and harvesting of power. So as you try and transmit great amounts of power over large di 
uh, distances. In order to do that, you have to generate very large and powerful electromagnetic fields, and these fields uh, pose a significant safety hazard uh, and also um, are a source of a significant amount of loss of efficiency. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we had another question off of Twitter. Uh, was was Edison a great inventor or just a great salesman? I mean, I think this has come up a bunch of times between when you compare the two, that one of them was a kind of a great CEO and one of them was a great geek, if you like. Um, so, Bernie, do you have a, a take on that? Was he more of an inventor or more of a salesman? I think that uh, it, it is clear that Edison had, compared to Tesla, a wider range of skills and abilities, that, that Edison could easily move from the boardroom to uh, talking to newspaper reports uh, back to his uh, his own little private workbench and, and do creative activities in all of those levels. And I think that a lot of people tend to overlook what Edison was able to do at the bench top. And one of my favorite examples that supports this is, is that there's always been a lot of belief that Edison, you know, simply appropriated the work of various uh, individuals that were working for him in the, 18, in the late, early 1890s uh, in and around the area of motion pictures. And what I found in studying Edison's notebooks quite carefully is, is, is that, that the work wasn't actually done by his assistants contributed to it, but that the really critical work as to how to figure out how to do early motion pictures, what Edison called the kinetoscope, uh, was the result of the fact that Edison really understood the circuits and the mechanical devices that you would need to do that. So there's no doubt in my mind that Edison was as as much a geek as, as Tesla was. He, of course, was, uh, you know, Edison was better able to deal with the business stuff. But at the end of the day, he, he, had, he had superb benchtop skills. Right. So, Peter, could I ask a question, follow up to that? Sure. So, Bernie, uh, it's always been my impression that Edison's real strength was um, was finding a way to make things work. An idea that somebody else had proposed or that he came up with, he was able to follow it through to completion and actually make a, a commercial product. Is that is that your impression of his his real strength as well, or? Well, again, I no, I agree that he he was he was always the guy that we would say in the in the patent business. Edison could reduce things to practice. In other words, that he could really actually figure out not just how to invent an electric uh, new incandescent bulb, but how to make one that was going to um, a you know last longer than than all of the competitors, and b how you would make at first a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand of those bulbs. And Edison had all of that sort of developmental skills, which again, in contrast with uh, with Tesla, Tesla had no real interest in that sort of engineering or or developmental work. He, was, as many people know, Tesla sold the uh, patents to his all AC motor to Westinghouse, and then he moves from New York City. Tesla does to Pittsburgh, and he stays there only about eight or ten months because there's pretty quickly the uh, the Westinghouse engineers and Tesla figure out that there is no real advantage to having Tesla work on the engineering sort of stuff. But I'm not sure I'd go so far as to say, Steve, that, that Edison never had a, a you know visionary or profound idea uh, in his life. I think that he, he did indeed have a number of different ideas. Again, you know, to use just an entirely different example, he's the one that basically sees the possibility for a phonograph. And, and in fact, after Ed Edison brings out the phonograph, Alexander Graham Bell writes to other folks, uh, to, to his friends, and he says, I can't believe I missed this idea, because they were both working with exactly the same sort of mechanical devices and devices related to sound. But Edison, Edison had a number of original and interesting insights, and so it's, it's not always fair to just sort of say, oh, well, he just took the ideas of somebody else and, 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 you know, and, and developed them you know, to, you know, so that they could be commercially feasible. Interesting. Uh, we've actually had a question that's a little uh, bit of a build-up on that uh, from a Teresa Grossman via Google+. Uh, so she says that many people have credited Edison with creating the light bulb, but that others were working on an incandescent bulb before him. So uh, what were Edison's contributions to lighting? Uh, Rob, do you have a, a take on that? Sure, uh, I'd be happy to, to make a quick statement on that. I mean, the, the incandescent bulb was worked on as, uh, as an idea and as an experiment uh, long before its a, a deployment as a commercially useful technology. And, um, 
and I'm not sure who actually was the first to invent it, but it, it wasn't Edison. Uh, and, and he really brought to bear many refinements to the construction of the incandescent bulb. He did a lot of work in uh, looking at different filament materials, uh, how to create a, an atmosphere that was conducive to a longer life bulb, and was extending the lifetime of these incandescent bulbs from something uh, that might be a couple of hours or even shorter into something that was weeks or months, and, and, uh, and that's necessary for it to become a commercially successful product. So I think his, his real innovation was in the specifics of the technology that led it to be both a, a usable product and a manufacturable product at a reasonable cost, which is really important for the propagation of innovative technologies in the marketplace. So Peter, if I could jump in there, uh, let me uh, build on, on that a little bit, which is, is this Charles Swan is often credited, if, if you're in England, as, as having developed one of the first incandescent lights incandescent lamps, you know, say 10, 15 years ahead of, um, of Edison. But I always uh, tell my students that the really critical two things that Edison did is, is first off, he realized that you wanted to have a high resistance filament uh, and that that would allow you to design the circuitry so you could have lots of bulbs on the circuit. But the, even more important than that is, is, is Edison had the critical insight uh, that you needed to think about how people were actually going to use electric lighting. There was very successful uh, arc lighting systems that were in existence at that time. And arc lighting, if, if folks don't know what that is, this is whenever there's an opening of a new store or a movie theater and there are those searchlights that sort of sweep across the sky, those are arc lights. And, and as, as you can readily see, those are incredibly powerful. They're on the order of something like 20 to 50,000 candle power whereas the lights that Edison worked on initially were 15 to 20 candle power, so several orders of magnitude smaller. And Edison's insight was to look around at the gaslighting industry that was taking shape in places like New York City and say, aha, what people want is not a great big electric light like the arc light, but an electric light that will work in their homes that will fit into existing patterns of energy consumption. And that is a really, it's a really, it's a subtle but a powerful idea that, that I think I try to pass on to my engineering students, which is, is this, even the most disruptive of technologies has to have some hook back into the way that people think about or, or need that they already have. In other words, any disruptive technology is an interesting mix of both the familiar and the unfamiliar. Interesting. Uh, so we just got a question in from, uh, on email from Frank. And this one's for Steve. Uh, had if Edison hadn't gotten the ball ro ball rolling with direct current DC, would Tesla have been able to develop the electrical system to deliver power to the public? Do you have a take on that, Steve? You know, that's that's a good question. It's hard to speculate on what would have happened in, in a certain respect. But I I will say that what Edison proved with his Pearl Street Station system was that you could commercially deliver electrical power to people's homes successfully. Um, and he was the first one to ever really do that. And so it inspired a whole range of companies across the United States and the world to try to develop these systems. So I think maybe it would not have been the case that Tesla's inventions would have never got off the ground, or we would have never had AC transmission or distribution. But I do think that, that uh, Edison's work was really the catalyst that made all that happen in such a short time frame in the in the late 1800s. Interesting, um, Frank. Uh, do you think there's if what do you think Edison or Tesla would be surprised by in today's technology, or would they be surprised by how much is the same, how little has changed? Frank, you know, you I'm know? not sure Tesla would have been very surprised because he predicted a lot of the things that we have today. And, and he, there's this famous Tesla quote where he says, you know, in the future, we will be able to talk to each other uh, across the world on a device that you can hold in your hand, right? So, he, so, so this, this quote's from like the 1930s, and he's, he's predicting the future of that televisions would be miniaturized, that we would have communications technologies that span the globe. Uh, I think he may have been a little surprised at exactly what we have, but he was pretty far-reaching as a thinker. Um, I'm not sure that... I think Edison maybe would have would have been a little more surprised because of his his views on what 
would and would not work, um, especially in terms of things like DC electricity. But I, I think maybe Rob or Bernie would have a, a better answer to that question. Uh, Rob, do you want to take a, take a stab at that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, I, I very much agree with Steve that uh, Tesla had um, a really expansive vision of how the future could be transformed through technology. And a great example there with the handheld device that you could talk to people around the world. Uh, and I would agree that, that many others, including Edison, uh, really didn't see key opportunities where technology is going to change how we live our lives. And one of the things that I think Tesla had uh, an edge on that some people might not appreciate as much is that he really had a powerful vision of the transformative potential that electric motors could bring. And that really uh, was an important part of what drove his obsession with uh, bringing his design for the AC induction motor to reality is that he really had this strong appreciation for the fact that you could take electricity and turn it back into mechanical work, whereas most people were really looking around taking that mechanical work from uh, uh, coal-powered steam engines, uh, driving uh, generators that created electricity, and then using that for really transformative applications in uh, lighting and also in uh, transformative applications in uh, communications of information. And so people definitely saw that electricity had really exciting potential. But I think Tesla was very early on one of the few people that really looked at this as having a really broader application, in particular around mechanical work. And, uh, and we see that today around the car that bears his namesake, um, that, that we've got electric cars driving the roads uh, that, uh, that use solely electric power as their means of locomotion. Great. Um, so there's a question from Twitter uh, for Bernie. Could you mention the role of George Westinghouse in the War of the Currents? And uh, she says that he's really complicates things for her. So um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about George Westinghouse. Sure. That's a, it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it complicates things. Uh, Tesla basically uh, works with a series of backers in 1886-1887 to develop this alternating current motor. He's working out of a laboratory that's, uh, you know, just around the corner from what you know where the World Trade Center once was on Liberty Street. And he then basically convinces Tesla and his backers convince Westinghouse to uh, buy the patents for the um, for the alternating current motor. Now Westinghouse, George Westinghouse, the man. Is 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 comes to electric lighting late. He's 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 the third of the big three in the in in the history of electric lighting in, or electric manufacturing in the U.S. Edison's obviously the first. There's a company that grows up around Elihu Thompson, the Thompson Houston Company. That company becomes General Electric, and then there's Westinghouse. Westinghouse is is because he's the he's the late comer to the industry. Decides that he's going to take the biggest risks. He's got to do something that's different than the other two the other two companies that are already in place. Westinghouse also has a, a substantial um, war chest. He has, he has, as we would say today, deep financial pockets because he's made a ton of money working um, you know, in the railway industry and developing inventions such as his, uh, his, his air brakes that are still used today on, on passenger and freight trains. So Westinghouse has the money, he has the inclination to, to take a big risk, and he has some interesting insights into how you would design a power distribution system. And he shares with Tesla, as, as one of my, my fellow panelists just pointed out, a real interest in, in how do you distribute power, power engineering. But Westinghouse is, is a critical player because he, he provides that complementary background that Tesla has the vision, but Westinghouse knows how to build the companies. And Westinghouse knows how to do the, the, the engineering work and to and to sell the products. So in some ways, you could even argue that Westinghouse is the, the sort of Steve Jobs uh, in in Tesla's life. Interesting. Uh, so the, uh, kind of a building on that, we had a question by email from Josh. The new long distance transmission lines with private financing are using DC current. Does that not prove it's better than AC? Why or why not? And that question is really pertinent to Steve, I guess. Uh, so it's it's true that DC does have some advantages to over AC when you're transmitting it over very long distances. Um, the the main I'm going to draw a little picture because I I brought some of my uh, my daughter's rose art markers today so I could draw pictures. Um, so the main issue is not the transmission. 
It's the conversion at each end of the line. So if you imagine this, uh, let me see if I can make this work. Mm. There you go. This is the transmission good. line. So we have it. We have the line that's in the middle here. When the electricity is traveling down that line, there's there's some resistance in the line, so there's some loss associated with the current flowing from one end to the other. But what happens really is that you also have on the ends, these boxes represent either transformers for AC, or you have really big power electronics converters. So you think about the, the wall cube that everybody has with their laptop computer. That's what's called a DC or an sorry, an AC to DC converter. Um, and it, it, it takes alternating current on one end, and it puts uh, DC current out on the other end to serve your laptop or your iPad or whatever else. So there's really large versions of these that they use in the transmission system. Our transmission system is mostly AC. So when you want to use a DC transmission line, you connect these AC to DC converters up to this long distance transmission line, and then you push the DC electricity across a long distance and you transform it back to AC at the other end. So the, the issue is that actually when the electricity is on the wire, DC is better. It's more efficient. Uh, there are the, the losses are lower, and you can push more energy through smaller amounts of wire, essentially longer distances. So that's really nice. Uh, but the problem is that on either end, the converters are not as efficient as transformers, even with all the state-of-the-art technology that you have today. So there's this trade-off between how long are you going to make that transmission line and how efficient are the converters at either end. So the answer pretty much turns out to be uh, if, you, if you get over a certain length, you should just use the converters and go to DC. But what it shows is that there's no technology that's inherently superior here. You have both technologies with a particular application. So um, if you were going to go to an all-DC grid, you would have to have these kind of converters everywhere. Turns out transformers are actually still more efficient than those converters, and so we still use an AC grid. Plus, we have 50 years' worth of AC technology installed, and it would cost a lot to replace all of that. Interesting. Thanks. Uh, so the, go ahead. Can I just follow up on that quickly? Is it? Um, I think that within the context of manufacturing, and particularly some of the larger and more complicated uh, equipment environments, that there's a frequent uh, back and forth and, and kind of internal competition between whether or not they do something using AC or using DC. So um, as, uh, as Steve mentioned, the, uh, the basis of, uh, of semiconductor technology and computer chips is, uh, is really working in DC. And so as you have uh, increasing use of computer technologies in a manufacturing equipment environment, you have increasing access to localized DC power. And so there's a whole suite of sort of local networks where they're already utilizing DC power. And then there are other pieces of equipment that have to kind of go on and off bus. Uh, and so some of them are using AC power. And so there are uh, increasingly uh, occurrences where you've got different pieces of equipment trying to operate in the same environment, but they're not all operating off the same power source. And they have complicated pathways between the wall and the power that they use and the way that they work with other pieces of equipment, the associated uh, capabilities, and also safety. And so uh, in some cases you end up with AC, in some cases you end up with DC, and the decision uh, for why you do that is not really always clear because a lot of times there's different products that will have different answers for how they chose to use power locally within their product. Interesting. Uh, so we have a new question via Twitter, um, and this one's for Bernie again. Uh, was the opening of the Niagara Falls power plant a victory for Tesla, and why? Niagara Falls absolutely was a, a victory for Tesla, and uh, he was he was uh, intricately related in the development of it. The the big idea with with Niagara Falls, uh, which was spearheaded by a man named Edward Dean Adams, was that it should be possible to collect, take advantage of Niagara Falls uh, and, and, the, and the water power there and distribute that power over long distances, first to Buffalo, New York, which was like 26 miles away, and then ultimately all over New York State and even to, uh, send Niagara Power by the end, of the end of the 19th century before 1900 to New York City. And all the way through the process, uh, Edward Dean Adams, uh, who was a very cagey uh, Wall Street financier went back and forth sort of saying, so should I use uh, DC, should I use alternating current, should I use two-phase, three-phase power? And all through this process he regularly queried, sent Tesla letters and said, so what do you think we I ought to do? And he 
Adams also asked a lot of other advisors, and, and indeed the famous physicist, um, in in most famous physicist probably in the world at that point, Lord Kelvin basically said, just telegraphed uh, Adams at one point and said, going with alternating current would be a terrible idea. You should use direct current, part for some of the things that um, that, that, that Steve has uh, been pointing out about modern, even modern day uh, DC transmissions. But in the end, uh, for a variety of reasons, Tesla prevailed and, all, and Niagara Falls used uh, two-phase alternating current uh, because it did allow, given the existing transformers at the time, the best way to transmit electricity, electric currents over the distances that they were interested in. So it was a real victory for, for Tesla and for alternating current. But Tesla's role was not involved in actually physically designing the plant at, at Niagara Falls. I've seen that in books or in even like actual, actually you know, being on hand at Niagara Falls when all of this took place. The work was again done by Westinghouse engineers and, and other, other uh, people that were more specialized in development. But Tesla played an important role in, in inspiring Adams to go with, uh, with AC. Interesting. Um, so uh, we have another question by Twitter. Who would be a bigger proponent of renewable energy? Rob, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure, I think uh, I would go with Tesla on that one. I think Edison um, had uh, had tremendous insight and vision uh, into how things might happen in the future, but I think uh, Tesla really was more expansive in thought and really was thinking more along the lines of the, uh, the importance of how energy utilization impacts our lives and looking at, uh, at the potential negative impacts of different types of energy deployments. Um, but I think uh, in both cases uh, there, was, there was limited insight into the longer term implications that we as a society face in terms of uh, uh, population growth and, uh, and population magnitude. And, and I think both would be challenged to really envision the level to which we as a society utilize energy per person and how many people we have uh, in the cities and towns where they were resident at the time. Uh, I think they would both be pretty surprised at the, the population density and then the corresponding energy density. I don't think either of them really thought that we could saturate the capacity of Niagara Falls. Uh, and I think clearly we vastly exceeded it today. Interesting. Uh, we have a great question from a high school student um, who wrote in, a uh, high school student Cody asks, uh, did Tesla have any heroes that you know of? Uh, Bernie, that sounds like one for you. That's a that's a very good question, and uh, it's it's always embarrassing when the biographer who spent 15 years on the project uh, doesn't exactly have something on the tip of his tongue. I, um, you know, I think that he he was very much enamored with with major people that reorganized the way that that science and engineering was was worked out, and so he he certainly took a, a very big interest in in Isaac Newton, and I think he saw Newton as one of his heroes. One of the um, the the things that he, one of the people uh, of his of the same time period that he did not see as a hero was was Albert Einstein. Edison had excuse me Tesla had absolutely no patience for for the likes of um, of, of of Einstein and and relativity. He also was was not very big. Tesla was not very big on quantum mechanics. Um, I think the other um, uh, person that Tesla really admired was a, was a chemist who. Um, uh, named Sir William Crook. So you, the, the Cody may have seen um, the the little uh, lamp shaped thing that the device it's called a Crook's a Crook's lamp, which has base or Crook's tube, which has the the veins inside that will revolve around in the in the sunlight. And and in fact, Tesla often gave people as a present Crook's um, you know Crook's lamps uh, because he thought this was a fascinating device. And I think he really admired how Crook's as a chemist in the 1880s and 1890s in London was able to cross successfully back and forth between the worlds of science and engineering and he saw he saw Crooks as a as a very much a role model so I guess uh, you know I fumbled it at the beginning Cody but uh, there's an answer for you great so um, I think I'll we want to go ahead Rob. I'll just add in one one quick suggestion that of a perhaps hero was uh, Voltaire that um, Voltaire uh, published him in, in critical works in the development of our understanding of electricity and uh, Tesla as an avid reader um, 
digested those hungrily uh, among many other volumes. And I'm, I'm reasonably confident that it was an important uh, book on Tesla's mental shelf uh, that he went to and thought about uh, in, in his intellectual work. Steve, any uh, insight on who uh, either one would have found a hero? Uh, I'm not. I'm not really the one to answer that question. Okay. Uh, well, as a kind of follow-up, we wanted to do a quick lightning round on just to wrap this up. Uh, Edison or Tesla? Who is the better inventor, and why? Rob, we'll start with you. Tesla. Uh, I think was more innovative in his thinking, more creative in his thinking, and I think that that's best exemplified through his uh, uh, solution to the uh, Columbus egg demonstration, where uh, he was down on his luck after uh, no longer working for Edison, was, was looking for gainful employment, and managed to impress somebody by making uh, a copper-plated egg spin on the table so that it would stand on its its uh, its end. And the fundamental innovation that uh, that enabled that was that he introduced a rotational component to a magnetic field, and so the egg was caused to spin uh, through its exposure to this uh, magnetic field with a rotational component. And indeed, this is the core uh, basis that inspired and enabled his uh, AC induction motor. And so he uh, was the first to really understand and manipulate magnetic fields in a rotational component context, but he also had the vision of how that was going to translate into a useful device, the AC induction motor, and then also how that was going to transform into uh, changing the way that we as a society work. Steve. Well, I, I think it depends a little bit on what you mean by inventor. I would argue that Edison was very much the better engineer. He knew how to make things work. Uh, he could take an idea and get it all the way through and make a commercial product out of it. Uh, but I, I admire Tesla's vision. I think he was the visionary. And he really had a grasp of what is possible. And, I, and, and the work that he's done has impacted just about every aspect of electrical engineering since the late 1800s until today. His contributions to wireless power transmission were basically the foundation for large-scale radio transmissions. And his work with the induction motor has, is what drives our factories today and all the way down to motors that you have in your electric vehicles of today. So when it, when it comes down to big ideas, I would give it to Tesla. Okay, Bernie, who's the better inventor? Well, I hate to uh, be the guy that comes in and sort of, you know, uh, you know, doesn't vote on Edison so that Tesla winds up uh, winning winning this uh, series three zip. But I'm uh, I'm going to come out in favor of uh, of Tesla as well. Again, as I always tell people, you know, the success of any industry, whether it be the electric power industry we've been talking about for the last few minutes, or the computer industry of the last thirty years, it's always a mix of people with different sorts of styles or, or strengths. Uh, you know, the computer in, personal computer industry today wouldn't be what it is without a mix of uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And at any given time, at least in American culture, we, we honor, we tend to gravitate towards one kind of hero or another. Um, and right now we're in a, we're definitely in a Steve Jobs sort of uh, mode. And, and similarly, we're in a, in a Tesla mode right now that we think that those sort of visionary uh, inventors are the are the critical people, but I'll add one more thing in Tesla's favor, and that is is is, is, is that you know as we move into the 21st century, we really live in a consumer society. We live in a society of personal information, and what really made Tesla different than his contemporaries was as early as 1902, 1903, he had a vision not just of of transmitting power wirelessly through the world, but even sending messages wirelessly through the world, and that every single individual would have a device, as he would say, no bigger than a pocket watch. And so he, he as early as that, as 100, over 100 years ago, was envisioning something that looks like the modern day smartphone. Now, he didn't understand, needless to say, the electronics or the, or the packet switching or all of the challenges that it would take to develop those technology, you know, develop the, the modern uh, technologies that we have today, but he had the insight that we were going to live in a society where lots and lots of products like telephones were going to be consumed on a personal basis, that there were going to be millions of them. 
and he was thinking about those sort of you know that sort of idea of personal information and personal technology well before even Henry Ford came along with the Model T in 1907. So you know if you want to say who invented the 20th or even the 21st century and you say the 21st century is about information, it's about consumers, then you have to go with Tesla. Okay, so the very fact that we're still having this debate today means that there may in fact be no right answer. Instead of Edison versus Tesla, we may have to start saying Edison and Tesla. And that's a good point for future innovators and researchers too, that no invention happens without the contributions of team members and supporters of all kinds. And that the success of any new scientific invention is based not just on technical genius and a great product, but a genius mind for usefulness and applications as well. So I want to thank our panelists today uh, and those who submitted questions and those who listened in. Uh, a recording of this Hangout will be available to view on the Department of Energy's YouTube account and on Breaking Energy. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, thank you to our panelists. Thank, thank you. you.